I first met Eleanor Cliff during the 1992 campaign when she spent a lot of time in Little Rock and all over the country covering Clinton. In fact, she probably uh, wrote more stories and did more coverage of him because that was her major assignment in the, in the 92 campaign. So we had many <coughs> great visits and several uh, you know, news interviews that I wouldn't necessarily call great, but, but, but at least uh, uh, respectable uh, during her time uh, here. And, we were, and, and, and I always enjoyed her company, and I saw her frequently in Washington. In 1994, she became a contributing editor uh, for Newsweek magazine. I don't know about you, but I follow her regularly on the McLaughlin Report, where I think she does a super job. <laughs> and she is a Fox News contributor. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> Howard Wilson is there, too. And in the spirit of bipartisanship, so is Carl Rove. Hey, we need people like Eleanor out there. And to give that. But, but today she's here to talk about a very moving and powerful subject that many of us can relate to and understand. It is the story of life and death from a very personal perspective. She's been, uh, she's written books before, but this one uh, has to be one of the most compelling. Uh, books written in a very personal and moving story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eleanor Clift. Good morning, and I'm so glad to see so many of you so bright and early, and uh, I'm very glad to be here back in Little Rock. Of course, I'm glad to be anywhere where I get to finish a sentence without getting interrupted. <laughs> um, I'm sure some of you do recognize me uh, from the McLaughlin Group, which is a televised public affairs show, but it's really more like a televised food fight. It's the only show we are expected to speak before you think and interrupting each other, calling each other names, being generally rude is all considered part of good television. Uh, that's the subject for a whole other talk. But the show is the creation of John McLaughlin, formerly Father John McLaughlin. He is a former Jesuit priest. And uh, I don't know how uh, many of you are familiar with the Jesuits. My husband uh, was educated at a Jesuit college, and so he told me that John was really, is really a familiar figure. The Jesuits have a uh, very uh, earned reputation for being full of moral certitude, highly educated, and loving a fight. And uh, whenever uh, a topic comes up where sometimes all four panelists agree, John will simply take the other side, you know, just for the sake of discussion. He says the point of the show is to create the greatest polarity. And by that he means he wants a fight. And so he picks panelists who come from different ends of the ideological uh, spectrum. Or although in the past we tended to be uh, journalists, that's kind of changed now. Um, there's all sorts of people in the political arena. And on the cable news channel, there's always a newly minted strategist on one side or the other. I think there must be a school other than the Clinton School of Public Service that turns these people out. Uh, <laughs> But the McLaughlin Group is designed uh, originally really like a men's locker room where a bunch of guys would sit around interrupting each other, uh, ragging on each other. My, again, my late husband used to call it towel snapping. Um, it is, it's not a style of conversation that women uh, feel comfortable with. And the first time that I did that show, now many years ago, I felt like I had been just landed into a completely parallel universe. There was Bob Novak, you know, the Prince of Darkness <laughs> in Washington, and um, Pat Buchanan, and, and um, I, you know, they, they would act as though I was completely from the loony left. And uh, it wasn't until, actually they were quite polite initially. They would occasionally let me speak, and then they simply would go back to what they were doing. It wasn't until, 
uh, Bob Novak wagged his finger in my, my face and said, Eleanor Clift and people of her ilk. Then I knew that I'd finally been accepted. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, my husband, Tom, used to help me get ready for the show. Uh, we were both runners, and we would go for a run, and we would run through the issues. But when he would speak to audiences, he would say, the way he got me ready, he would simply shout, wrong, wrong. <laughs> um, now, Tom uh, died in, in March of 05 after a, a very long battle with uh, kidney cancer that uh, first spread to his uh, lungs and then to his uh, brain. And... Uh, I, I miss him every Friday for the Mark Laughlin group, and I miss him a lot of uh, other times, too. And I, I wrote a, uh, a column, uh, actually, the, the uh, two days after he, he died, it was my deadline for my column, and I thought, you know, I can't write about Tom DeLay. <laughs> I'm going to write about Tom. And I, so I wrote a tribute to the grace and the courage that he uh, exhibited through this very long a fight because he was a man who had trouble handling a sinus infection and so I think it was to his surprise and to mine how he um, you know rose to the occasion to this catastrophic diagnosis that he had received and the and the treatments and the fight that it that it took and uh, so uh, the column uh, was was published on news posted on Newsweek's uh, website and it attracted the interest of a publisher in New York who called me up, said he wanted to have lunch, and I assumed uh, that he wanted to have, uh, have me write a political uh, book. And halfway uh, through the lunch, we really had trouble settling on a topic that I could rant about for 70,000 words. And uh, he said, you know, you have a personal story uh, to tell. And I said, I know, it'll be the last chapter of the memoir I write uh, someday. And he said, no, you should write it now, and you should write it in the context of the debate in the country over Harry Schiavo. Now, Tom had what I like to say the journalistic good sense to die the day before Harry Schiavo. And the uh, duality of these two deaths uh, were very much on my mind as I was called upon to comment on the McLaughlin Group and to write about the Shivo case in, in Newsweek while I was very much living an end-of-life drama in my own uh, living room. Um, I was ambivalent at first. I really didn't quite see how the two stories could come together. Uh, but I warmed to the idea, and I think um, in part because I saw it as a way for me to come to terms with how my life had been so radically uh, altered. Um, you always think these things happen to somebody else. And of course, you know, we were supposed to grow old together. And I also knew um, that Tom would approve of my uh, writing about uh, this experience because he had been very public about his disease. Uh, we had done uh, the Diane Rehm show on National Public Radio twice on uh, living with cancer uh, the first time, and then when Tom decided to have whole brain uh, radiation to, to try to contain the cancer, uh, knowing that that, uh, as the, the story said, would t take ten, 10 points off of his IQ, and he was still joking about it. I later learned that when you have whole brain radiation, that's really palliative care, that it's um, uh, not really uh, anything cur curative about it, but I, when, when you're in, in it, you think everything holds out the possibility of cure. So we had done the Diane Rehm show uh, twice, and Tom had uh, you know, joked about uh, wanting to get a uh, hairpiece that was uh, better looking than Sam Donaldson's. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Sam is a friend, and you know, he had melanoma years ago, and people were nervous about calling him up and what do you say to him after he'd been diagnosed. And he would pick up the phone and he would say, Melanoma Central, uh, immediately putting people at ease. <laughs> so, um, and uh, Tom was a journalist. He uh, worked for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Um, he's one of these uh, people that probably don't exist anymore, won't exist anymore. He grew up delivering the newspaper, then called in the sports scores when he was in high school and college, and then you know, got a, got a job there and went on to become a political writer and their uh, Washington bureau chief. And so he had a column, and he had written a dozen columns over uh, five years, um, a, beginning with the diagnosis, really, of, 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 ki of kidney cancer when he 
titled that column um, minus one kidney but still flossing to indicate, <laughs> to indicate life was going to go on. And then when he got the diagnosis of metastatic cancer a year later, he compared it to being on the 90th floor of the World Trade Towers and not knowing whether you were going to get out uh, alive, but you were sure going to try. Uh, the columns uh, form the appendix of, of the book, and I'm very pleased that they're all included because when I first suggested to the editor I wanted to include the columns, he said a dozen, he said, can't you pick three, and three or four? And they were only 800 words <laughs> each. And I said, okay, well, you pick. And uh, I gave him the packet of columns, and he was taking the train from Washington to New York, and he called me when he got to New York. He said, okay, <laughs> we'll include, include them all. Um, the story um, uh, of the hospice experience, which really uh, forms the heart of this book on my, per my personal side, uh, began shortly after Thanksgiving in '04 when we were visiting the oncologist. And uh, he uh, said that he thought it was time for Tom to take a break uh, from the chemo and go home and recover his strength. And he made it sound so positive that Tom actually thought that this was good news until he looked over and saw me uh, crying because I had heard the little word hospice tucked in there. And I didn't know a lot about hospice at the time, but I knew that it required a six-month uh, diagnosis uh, that said six months or less left to live. And so it felt like suddenly getting uh, the, de the death uh, sentence. And I had, um, for, for years now, I had gotten so used to saying, you know, cancer is like any chronic illness, it can be managed. And I would actually get irritated when people would, uh, you know, suggest there was something dire wrong. Um, so I had really fooled myself into thinking uh, that this could go on almost uh, uh, indefinitely. And in fact, cancer can be managed for quite a long time, but often the day of reckoning comes and there's a rather uh, swift uh, decline, which is why it makes it a, a, an illness that's kind of uniquely uh, works with, with, with the, that hospice uh, six months. I think as a society, we really haven't come to grips with the, with the debilitating illnesses that people live with for a long time in the frail elderly, but that's again the subject of a whole uh, other uh, book. Uh, Joan Didion's uh, book, The Year of Magical Thinking, had an impact on me. Now, her husband died from a sudden heart, heart attack at the, at the dinner table, but I could relate to her, her disbelief and how um, she reacted by simply going through the paces of living. And uh, that's what I've, what I've done, and I get a lot of people always say to me, oh, you're so strong. I don't feel particularly strong, but to me, the alternative of collapsing in the, in the corner in, a, in, in tears would make me feel that much worse. And so when this project came along, I think you know, it really it filled my time for two and a half years. And as a journalist, you're always told that you should write what you know. And I certainly knew this. And so for me, it was a cathartic uh, experience. And uh, the book is titled Two Weeks of Life, a Memoir of Love, Death, and Politics. And it's written in diary uh, form of those final uh, two weeks. And uh, not much changed in Tom's uh, situation, to be honest. Uh, but I tell his story and mine through flashbacks, but a lot happened in the Kerry Schiavo uh, situation. She was the center of a legal, political, and moral uh, firestorm. Uh, to recap just the basic uh, facts, uh, she had been in uh, a persistent vegetative state, which is shorthanded as PVS, for 15 years after she had collapsed at age 26, and her husband had cared for her for much of that time, but he had also uh, taken up with another woman and had fathered uh, two children uh, with um, the woman who was now his wife. And he had appealed uh, to the courts for the right to remove uh, Kerry Schiavo's feeding tube uh, on the grounds that uh, her situation was hopeless and that she would not uh, recover and that this is what she would have wanted. Uh, her parents uh, sued uh, to stop that action, and by the time the story burst into the national headlines in March of 05, which is the period I write about, it was the third time 
that the feeding tune had actually been uh, removed. And the parents had prevailed twice before to have it reinstated with help from uh, Governor Jeb Bush and the intervention of the Florida legislature, which had passed a Save Perry's uh, Law, which then the Florida Supreme Court had declared unconstitutional. And so now, in March of 05, after some 30 court actions, the case had gotten kicked up to the United States uh, Congress, and Terry Schiavo had become an icon of the religious right, and the issue of when life ends had become entwined with the abortion uh, debate, part of what uh, my friend Pat Buchanan calls a, the culture of life and the culture wars. Uh, the Republican-controlled Congress at the time was led by Tom DeLay, he was in the midst of some ethics problems of his own and eventually was forced to resign. But at the time, he welcomed the Shivo case as a uh, distraction, and he, call, he actually called it a gift from God. And on the Senate side, uh, Senator Bill Frist, um, actually who'd been an acclaimed uh, pediatrician and heart surgeon before he uh, went into politics, he rendered a long-distance diagnosis on the floor of the Senate, saying that based on watching a video of Terry Schiavo, he had concluded that she was not in a persistent vegetative state. Um, in the book, I quote a hospice physician saying, if Senator Frist really believed that, he should be kept away from sharp objects. Uh, uh, President Bush, you might remember, interrupted his vacation in Crawford, Texas. It was Easter, and he flew back and signed legislation uh, urging the federal courts to overturn the state courts to uh, intervene and have the feeding tube removed. He signed that legislation at 1.11 in the morning. Congress and the president moved at extraordinary speed, when normally this institution doesn't do anything faster than a glacial pace. Um, and they were stunned when the polls came out, and they showed that 82% of Americans thought uh, that this was not a situation where government should be involved. And that included a majority of self-described evangelicals, and that number was 68%. So I, I lay all that out, um, but um, I hasten to say this is not a, a, a political uh, book, not a partisan political book. I am sympathetic to all sides. I talk to Terry Schiavo's parents and her brother, and I give them a sympathetic portrayal. They had had enough visits with Terry that they believed, I think wrongly, that she could recover. A person in a persistent vegetative state has sleep and wake cycles, their eyes open and close, they, make, they, they grimace, they make sounds. And so if you want to believe that there is conscious thinking, I think, and, and this is a loved one, I can understand how they get there. Uh, and their position was that, and the father actually said this, even if her legs had been amputated, if they were gangrenous, um, they would love her anyway. They, they loved her unconditionally. And the point is, in our legal system, it's not about them and what they would want. It was about determining what this young woman would want. And Michael Schiavo, although he was not the most sympathetic person and says, I'm not warm and cuddly, uh, he had produced enough convincing evidence to satisfy numerous judges that his wife would not want to live uh, this way. And she had verbally expressed that a couple of times, you know, watching TV, saying, oh, I wouldn't want to die that way. And now, uh, however casually, uh, the courts determined that counted. And it was the tape of Terry Schiavo that made her case uh, news. It was that sweet smile, and she did seem to respond. I, I learned that that tape had been edited down for many hours to make it appear as though she was tracking objects. The autopsy that was done showed that she was blind, that her optic no nerve had been totally destroyed. So she couldn't have seen anything. Now on the McLaughlin group, I reflexively took the position that this woman should be allowed uh, to die. Uh, 
Uh, and there was a rigorous debate within our little television group, both on and off camera. John McLaughlin at one point, he didn't say it on, on uh, TV, but he said those parents should get some bereavement counseling. And Pat Buchanan, who is Jesuit educated and a really strong practicing Catholic, uh, took the position uh, that food and water, if, even if it's artificially delivered, is not extraordinary means. Now, the Catholic Church says you don't have to accept extraordinary uh, means. And McLaughlin took the Catholic Church's uh, traditional side, and they would argue Catholic doctrine back, back and forth together. It was really quite fascinating. And then I would go home, and the debate would continue in my living room. The young hospice nurse would roll her eyes in dismay as uh, we would watch the images on CNN of protesters trying to sneak water and food into Kerry Shivo. And this nurse would say, don't they know that would asphyxiate her? And uh, then she would go on and would, ex would, would explain to me how, you know, Kerry Shivo is not experiencing hunger pains and uh, that she's going to die of dehydration, which is actually uh, one of the better ways to die. There's actually some euphoria associated with it. And she would explain this all matter-of-factly. And in fact, this was what was happening to my husband as well in the bed. Uh, and then there was an older woman who I had hired to come in in the afternoons. And um, she was horrified that this feeding tube was uh, being removed. Now, I did not debate her. I actually was grateful that she felt this dedication, and I figured that would transfer to my, my uh, loved one. So the media firestorm generated a lot of confusion about science, medicine, and the law, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. And so I intertwined these uh, stories to get at how we uh, die in uh, America. Uh, as I said, Tom died March 30, which was the day before Kerry Schiavo, and the Pope would actually die that following Saturday. And in life, uh, Tom Brazitis was very competitive as a writer, a runner. He was a high school basketball player. One point, when, as he began losing all this weight, he was actually pleased he'd gotten down to his high school weight of 165. <laughs> um, and uh, I did remark to the hospice nurse that in the race to the pearly gates between uh, Kerry Schiavo and the Pope and Tom, that Tom had won. <laughs> And then I thought better of it. I thought, or lost. <laughs> and she said, you know, depending on your perception, she said he won. Um, hospice does play a central uh, role these last four months of Tom's life, uh, making possible uh, what I uh, imagine is a, a good death when death is in inevitable and imminent. And we live in such a death-defying culture that most people don't accept hospice soon enough. They spend less than two weeks. And I think that's changing as the baby boom generation comes to grips with its mortality. The hospice movement is growing, and so is the demand for the kind of holistic style of care uh, that hospice provides. And um, I'm now on the board of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, and the president of that organization said, uh, knowing the baby boomers, pretty soon there'll be demand for death trainers and below-ground lattes. <laughs> um, that's obviously exaggeration. Uh, and I must say, I was uneasy at first. Um, I, I, there were no, there not going to be any more doctor visits. You don't see a doctor when you go into hospice. You, you have a relationship with a primary care nurse who comes by twice a week at the beginning, more if you need her. Uh, and you get visits from health care aides um, during the week, but they don't work on the weekends. And uh, this realization hit me that I was in charge. And it was pretty terrifying at first. And as I got into it, I told Tom had a wicked sense of humor. I told him I was getting into this caregiving role. And he said, you better watch out. I, I hear they're recruiting from the ranks. <laughs> um, and. Uh, you know, I, I talk about religion in the book. Uh, Tom was a fallen away Catholic, and he uh, had embraced uh, atheism, um, and he didn't flinch those last months. He was not afraid. He figured it was like going to sleep, and it would be like it was before he was born, no consciousness. Now, um, oblivion uh, terrifies some people. He found it comforting. And unlike 
Terry Shivo's family. I didn't have anyone questioning my judgment about how to handle these final days. Uh, Tom was very clear about what he wanted. He had arranged his cremation a year ahead of time, uh, and stubbornly I didn't open that envelope until I had to, and then I was very grateful uh, to him for having uh, that roadmap. So I want to uh, leave plenty of time here for your questions that I want to include on a, conclude on a somewhat lighter note. Uh, Art Buckwald is uh, featured in the book. He is a, 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 has, was a friend of mine for years. Uh, he had his office on the same floor at Newsweek in Washington for a long uh, time. So he was a friend. <coughs> and I don't know how many of you are familiar uh, with his uh, story, but uh, he uh, had... Uh, uh, had some sort of um, um, health event that required a part of one leg to be amputated, and then he was told he needed to go on dialysis. I think he did two or three dialysis treatments, and he was uh, 80 years old, and he said, I don't want to do this. And his children tried to uh, talk him out of it, uh, but he um, decided to end the dialysis, and he checked into the Washington Home Hospice in uh, Washington expecting to die except his kidneys started to work uh, again. <laughs> uh, and uh, so in the hospice, he resumed writing his column. The first one was called The Man Who Wouldn't Die. Um, uh, then he uh, uh, wrote, wrote a column about um, a hospice as scam and how he'd uh, you know, fool the hospice people. Um, and he uh, would hold... Uh, you know, visiting hours in, in the day room of this hospice. And I mean, Ethel Kennedy came, ambassadors came, Donald Rumsfeld came. He had a whole stream of visitors. And he would say to me, Eleanor, if I was just doing dialysis four hours, three times a week, nobody would visit me <laughs> and nobody would care. He loved it. I mean, he absolutely uh, thrived on it. And uh, at the end of the six months, uh, they started charging him. <laughs> and. <laughs> He said, he said it was about the cost of a, of, of, of a uh, first-class suite at the Four Seasons. Now, he, he could afford it, and he did pay it for a while, but then he did check out and uh, went to um, Martha's Vineyard and wrote, wrote, a, wrote a book called Heaven Can Wait. Uh, <laughs> so um, he uh, actually, you know, when, when you... They don't really throw you out after six months, and if he didn't have the finances, I don't think they would have charged him. But the irony is if he'd gone back on dialysis, which would have been much more expensive, the government would have picked up the tab. But uh, the, my favorite um, uh, point of, of visiting Art is that um, he, uh, he was a cultural Jew, but he wasn't a practicing Jew, and he had uh, met with a rabbi and planned his whole funeral service, uh, but he was, you know, joking, and, and here was a man who had suffered from bipolar depression in his regular life, and he was not unhappy at all. And so the chaplain at the hospice pulled me aside one day and told me that she didn't think that he was taking this seriously enough. <laughs> um, and, you know, that overworked word, closure, he was coming to closure, and I said, well, you know, you should you know, mention that to Art. And so Art said, okay, I've met with the rabbi. You're a Protestant. If you want to bring in a Catholic priest, it's fine with me. He said, I'll cover all my bases. So she, she brings in a Catholic priest, and he had uh, remembered the columns that Buckwald had written during the whole Nixon impeachment period. And as Art puts it, the priest was for Nixon. But... <laughs> <laughs> they spent 40 minutes talking politics, and Art looked over at the chaplain, and she looked very disconsolate. And he said, I think she thought the priest would come in and say, let's pray, or some bullshit like that. <laughs> <laughs> so my point here is, you know, death is, is part of life, and it's worthy of the honesty and the humor that we give all the other milestones. And um, I to to some extent, I hope this book helps to take death out of the closet. I point out uh, that Tom and I used to watch Six Feet Under on HBO together, and it opened up lots of conversations that we might not otherwise have had. And I must say, on the day that the van pulled up to retrieve the body, I, I thought that uh, David 
or Nate who was going to come to my front door. But I knew what to expect, and uh, it helped, helps a lot to know what to expect when you're in this un uncharted uh, territory. So with that, I'd like to take your questions, and we can talk about politics as well, because um, that's, of course, very much in the air. Okay. We have time for some questions. We have two mics. Volunteers are, are in the back. So please raise your hand, and we'll I've got this one, and we'll, we'll move to it. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind uh, sharing with us some of the things that you found helpful after your husband's death, uh, dealing with grief, whether it's grief support group or right. counseling or books such as John Didion's book? Right. Um, the week that Tom died, we had, um, the McLaughlin group, we had taped a show earlier, which is what we call it an evergreen, because it was Easter week. And then, because Shivo had died, John McLaughlin called me up and said, do you, would you like to do the show? This was Friday, we taped, Tom had died Wednesday. I instantly said yes. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I had a living room full of flower arrangements. I had two huge deli platters. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, we weren't going to have an Irish wake for three days. Uh, you know, family members are all over the, the, the country. And, and um, I, was, I was so happy to get out and do what I normally do. I wanted normal, normality. And a friend of mine called me up and uh, they asked me how I was doing. And I mentioned I was going to do the group. And she said, oh, Eleanor, I don't think you should pop up on television so soon. People will think you're cold and heartless. And uh, I, th I thought, oh my, and then my, I have three grown sons. My middle son was visiting. He immediately went to the internet and plugged in widows grie grieving, bereavement. <laughs> and out pops an article that he downloads that says, people deal with grief in all sorts of ways. Some people, you know, sit in a darkened room and don't see anybody and, you know, for days. Other people distract themselves with activity me. <laughs> so I figured if my son said it was all right, it was all right. And when I showed up for the McLaughlin group, and I do include this in the book, Pat Buchanan said to me, you took a big hit, kid. And you know, it, was a, it was a nice line. And, and then John did a tribute to Tom on the show. And uh, he had um, initially was going to read what he was going to say live and he, during the practice reading he couldn't get through it without his voice breaking up and so he had taped it earlier and it was a really nice tribute and then the show went to black and then I could do my crying. Um, but I did try some uh, bereavement groups and I went to one that uh, was for people who wanted to write about their experience. First of all it was all women. There was one man and he had a manuscript in the works about how he could love two women at once, the woman who had just died and the woman he'd taken up with. I think the rest of us, <laughs> we, we were ready to run him out of the room. <laughs> and, uh, and I found, you know, the grief of some of the other people. There were two women whose husbands had had uh, ALS. I found that it was just so raw. I, and it was, and then the, the, the gentleman who was leading the group brought out a guitar and began to strum, and and uh, so that none of that worked for me. What worked what worked for me was just you know doing what I do and maybe you know being a little more obsessive about work and stuff. But that's what's helped me. But I I, I certainly you know I I don't pretend to be any kind of authority, and I think everybody is is, is different. And um, I found, actually, the first year I was just happy with myself if I got through the day. And the second year I began to think, well, maybe I should be, you know, creating more of a separate life and all that. And I don't know. I think getting through the day is kind of enough. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question. Anyone? Would you comment on what, uh, what you think um, the state is now after Terry Schiavo between the intersection of family rights in these situations and politics, if we've learned anything, particularly in Washington? 
Right. I, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think that um, the Congress really learned a lesson. And um, Senator Tom Harkin, uh, one of the few Democrats who uh, was on the side of trying to you know, save Terry Schiavo, he had a, a brother uh, with uh, mental uh, retardation issues, and he's always been uh, very involved with the disability community. And um, he did understand the disability community, which tends to be uh, liberal and secular, was lined up with the religious right on this issue because they felt that if society looked at a life like Terry Schiavo's and decided it wasn't worth continuing, you know, who, who, who was next? Uh, and so uh, Senator Harkin tried to figure out if there was some sort of legislative vehicle that would, you know, protect uh, people uh, in, in a situation like, uh, like Terry Schiavo's. Uh, and he, he, he gave up. I mean, I, and I interviewed um, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, she had stepped down from the court by then, but I asked her to revisit uh, one of the decisions the high court had made in the case of a young woman named Nancy Cruzan, whose family wanted to uh, let her, her die, and the state of Missouri uh, objected. And um, it, the, the Supreme Court uh, did not side with the family, but they opened the door to the family coming back with more evidence that the young woman would not uh, want this to happen. And Sandra Day O'Connor said, you know, look, um, judges are as incapable of dealing with this issue as ordinary people. You know, we avoid it at all costs. And then she went into her very own moving story of her uh, husband who'd been battling Alzheimer's for years. She said he had notes all over the house trying to you know, keep up his cognitive abilities. And she left the court in large part because he would get so upset when she left the house. She was then bringing him to the court with her every day, and it was not getting to be an untenable uh, situation. And uh, she then uh, had to in institutionalize him, and then it was quite a, uh, 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 it was a front page USA Today story, I guess a year or so ago, that uh, he had fallen in love with someone in the, in the care facility. And she was fine with that because uh, she wanted him to, to be uh, comfortable. So I went to interview her to find out all about the legalisms, and I, instead I got a personal story. And so much of this, people come at it through their own personal uh, experience. But I think uh, government has learned uh, that it's not a place. I mean, it, it didn't pay off politically at all. And so, but it, 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 we're working this out every day around the bedside of people in hospitals that now have these sort of um, uh, commissions to discuss, you know, what is feudal care and what isn't. I mean, there are a lot of very complicated uh, uh, issues. And, I, and it's not enough to have just a end of life directive. You really have to have somebody who knows you and knows what you would want to be able to step in and make decisions if you're not uh, able to. Again, um, you know, I, I, did, I conducted one interview with an ethicist, and I have a, uh, a son, I guess, how old is he now? Well, early 30s. And um, the, uh, this ethicist said to him, now, you're, you're the kind of person you really ought to have some sort of a directive. You know, you car accident, motorcycle accident. And my son said, I want to be kept alive no matter what. And I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> but you know, if something happened to him, I would have to, I would, that, I would have to listen to that. Um, anybody else? Over, there. Over here. Um, there was a... Um, after the Sherry Chavo case, there was a big rush on living wills. And I was wondering, did your husband have a living will? And uh, also, I'm kind of curious, you mentioned that um, there weren't any doctors at the hospice. Is there some rule that they don't have to have a living will, that if you go to hospice, they're not going to treat you? They're just going to let you die the way you want? Um, well, I think the compact when you go into hospice is that you're not accepting curative care, you're accepting palliative care. And so it's really, it's a lot about pain management 
And when I, you know, the, the, the primary care nurse is very uh, competent, uh, but, you know, it's about avoiding bed sores, it's, it's comfort care. Um, now, a, a, as I interpret a living will is what you will or will not uh, accept. Now, um, they would not put you on a, on a feeding tube to keep you alive in a hospice situation. They might use it, it to keep you comfortable if that's necessary. So there's a, a difference. And uh, my husband, it's interesting because he had uh, so methodically done so, so much ahead of time, you know, arranging the cremation, telling me what kind of memorial service he wanted, attending one, sitting in the back, taking notes, and, you know, and all of that. Uh, he didn't leave a will. He had uh, visited an attorney. He had um, downloaded all the documents. <laughs> um, and uh, I, one of the people I interviewed for the book was a, a, a therapist who specializes in end-of-life uh, situations, people with calamitous uh, medical situations, and Tom had been seeing him, Dr. Stephen Hirsch. And he told me that it's not that unusual for somebody who knows they're dying to leave one major thing undone. It's as though it's pushing, <laughs> pushing the date further out. Uh, so that was, um, you know, I, I looked everywhere. Maybe there was some will hidden somewhere, but I never, he didn't, he didn't do it. He had a lot of false starts, but he, he didn't do it, which is kind of interesting psychologically. Steve. Aaron. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned memorial service. You know, there's a lot of changes going on uh, with memorial services today. You mentioned cremation. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of things, I was curious what, what his memorial service was like and, and what is your opinion now as, as people are thinking differently now uh, about memorial services, more people are being cremated? Well, um, the, the memorial, and Tom wanted to use the word celebration, which I still stumble over, uh, you would not have the, a casket there or a body, I mean, that's just not, it, it, and we, it was, we did it, I think, um, it was probably a month later, four or five weeks later, uh, and it, it took, and it was at the National Press Club, and it took that while to pull it together. And um, I, uh, because Tom had been a political reporter and covering Ohio, I wanted to get um, Ohio politicians, and um, Dennis Kucinich spoke. Um, Tom had known him forever, and uh, when uh, Dennis finally won his congressional seat, uh, he recalled that Tom said to him, now what? <laughs> uh, but Dennis had gotten Tom on um, organic eating, uh, and uh, Kucinich is a, is a you know, vegetarian organic eater, and, and he would call Tom when he was ill, and I would say, um, you know, it's Dennis Kucinich, and Tom would say, I know, it, the almost president. <laughs> um, and Senator Glenn uh, spoke, um, and, um, Tom had been a member of the Gridiron, which is this group of journalists that spoofs politicians, and he had uh, written a, uh, a parody song that Senator Glenn performed, and it was about how after Senator Glenn went back into space and got all this attention, he was giving advice to the other oldsters in the Senate how they could get similar advice. And so I asked Senator Glenn if he would reprise the song, and he said, you know, Tom made me sing once, I'm never gonna do it again. And so, much to my surprise, at the, at the celebration, <laughs> he got up and he, and he sang, and he, and he was a huge uh, hit. And then uh, Congressman Lewis Stokes, who um, had uh, his brother, Carl Stokes, was the first African-American mayor in Cleveland, and Lou Stokes was on the Watergate committee. And when Tom was first assigned to Washington to cover Watergate, he didn't know who anybody was, but he knew Lou Stokes. And so he was this grand gentleman, and he, he, he also uh, spoke. And then I you know, had an army buddy. But uh, the most uh, person who, who really riveted the room was a, a gentleman named uh, Phil Barrigate, who um, started his comments at the, uh, at the service saying that he had read Tom's column, he had waited in line in federal prison in order to read a column about um, uh, the disparity in sentences for nonviolent offenders. And uh, Phil uh, Barrigate had been in prison at that point, I 
five, five, five years into a 15-year sentence for white-collar crime. And uh, Tom went to bat for him and uh, helped him win uh, parole. And so he told uh, his story, and that was um, so. And when I asked him to speak, he said, will I embarrass you if I tell my story? I said, I'm a journalist. I'm asking you to tell your story. <laughs> I know what's, uh, what people are going to be interested in. And so it is almost, you're putting on like a show of the person's life, really. Um, and, you know, enough weeks have passed uh, that people are able to uh, come at it with a, a lighter, a lighter uh, mood. And so uh, that's, that's what we did, and it, it, it seemed to have worked. Last question. Uh -huh. A few times I've watched uh, flinch, but I'm always really proud of you and think that you are tough enough to handle those big guys and appreciate it so much. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you that a couple of months ago, this school brought Jim Wallace here. Um, oh, yes. And it was a remarkable um, talk. And I wrote a sentence, and I've got my notes with me. He said, I believe the dominance of the religious right is finished. And so I would like your, your thoughts on that. Um, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think actually the intervention on the Shivo side, which actually the religious right didn't even favor all that much, but that was the beginning of the end for the Republican-controlled uh, Congress. And then the fact that um, the religious right was not able to get a candidate of their liking, uh, I suppose Mike Huckabee in the... In the, in the um, primaries might qualify, but they didn't really have a credible candidate who could win the nomination. And John McCain, of course, has his difficulties with them. And then the Democrats have gotten smart about reclaiming God. And uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Barack Obama have talked more openly about issues of faith. And Obama has actually unsettled some on the left by embracing the faith-based initiative that uh, was championed by uh, President Bush. And Jim Wallace and others uh, now on the progressive side are, are, are trying to um, get a more you know, vis visible role that connects religion with progressive policies. And then the evangelicals also have decided that they're worried about the planet and they care about environmentalism. And so uh, the, the, the lines are not so rigid between uh, right right and left, and uh, the whole thrust of the Obama campaign is to bridge the divide, and certainly, and John McCain is a, a maverick who's wor worked across party lines. So I think we have two of the most uh, uh, un, 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 untethered candidates in terms of sort of party I ideology, and I think, you know, that's, that's good for the country and good for our politics, I hope. <laughs> Thank Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's say thanks to Eleanor Flick. <laughs> I'm going to let Nikolai uh, escort Eleanor back so we can uh, start the book signing. So, Eleanor, if you will uh, accompany uh, Nikolai and get situated, you can purchase and, and, and buy the books uh, uh, at the back entrance. While we're doing that, let me uh, recognize a person who walked in uh, a little bit late, but one who is responsible for the great success for this school and for uh, doing a lot of good things for Arkansas over the years. State legislator, congressman, governor, senator, and dean David Pryor, right here. Thank you all for coming, and have a good day.